Thanks again for joining us. I'm Erin Schoenberg. I'm with the Center for Rural Affairs. And then Ben McShane Jewell from Nebraska Extension is joining me tonight to give this presentation. We are also partnered with Buy Fresh by Local Nebraska. And the three of our organizations have received a Farmers Market Promotion Program grant from the USDA. And it's a three year program, which we're very excited about. It's all about helping rural farmers markets. And that includes manager support as well as vendor support. And so with COVID, things are looking a little different for us in this first year. But some of you might recall, we did some farmers market questionnaires in the spring to get feedback from folks on what resources might be helpful. And we have put together a series of online trainings and so we are wrapping up the last two workshops. We've got marketing and vendor recruitment tonight, and then uh, legal structure and SNAP tomorrow. I will have Ben um, get started with the marketing piece first. Great, all right. Um, as Aaron said, so I'm Ben McShane Jewell. I'm with the University of Nebraska Extension, and I am based out of Blair up in Washington County and cover a five county region around the Omaha metro area. And I'm part of a kind of relatively new initiative out of extension called the Regional Food Systems Initiative. And so we work as a team to support uh, producers and, and vendors and market managers like yourselves um, to make sure that um, local food is getting to the consumers that want it and to the markets that are looking for it. So really happy to be here and appreciate you all joining tonight. <clears throat> so I'll just give you a heads up. I'm going to Normally we would have Skylar Falter from Buy Fresh by Local, usually does the second half of this uh, marketing presentation, but she couldn't join us tonight. So I'm gonna pinch hit for her and try to do her part of it as well. So if you see some slides coming up in a little bit with Skylar's picture on it, just know that I'm filling in for her um, tonight. So uh, really happy you all could join us and looking forward to this. And as Aaron said, please just jump in, ask questions, put the questions in the chat, whatever. Um, you need to do as we're going forward here. We'll keep this a little bit informal. So I'm going to talk about marketing and, you know, first just want to kind of highlight some reasons why marketing is important for particularly for direct to consumer vendors and market managers. <clears throat> so really marketing is about fulfilling a customer's need. So anything that you're doing, whatever you're selling, whatever products are you're growing and selling and bringing to market, there has to be a consumer demand for that. It has to fill a need that a consumer is looking for. Otherwise, you're kind of, uh, you're working against yourself right from the start. So it should really be about meeting a consumer need. It's also about building relationships. <clears throat> and I think particularly important to think about, you know, not only who are the customers that you have coming to your market right now, those sort of regular folks that you see week after week and probably buying your products week after week, but thinking about, how do I use my marketing to find prospective future customers who maybe didn't know that you were there or haven't been to your booth yet? How do you connect with those folks and really start to build that long-term relationship with them? And then <clears throat> marketing is a way for you to tell your story, whether that's about your market itself, about your business as a, a farm a farmer uh, coming to the market, uh, marketing is your tool and your suite of tools to um, really communicate to the consumer who you are and what sort of values you hold as a business or as a market. And ultimately, marketing hopefully is a tool to generate sales. It should be a way that um, not only tells your story, but tells your story in a way that allows you to um, generate more profit for your business. And again, it just kind of connects you with leads for future sales. So one of the things that's really valuable about marketing um, and one way to really think about it, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit later, but um, even if you're not making a sale immediately with that future consumer, if you can capture their information, get them on say an email listserv where you're kind of emailing out more information to them uh, week after week, that's a real opportunity to start building that relationship. So. It's not a loss if you didn't make a sale right away, if you got connected to that person and you can continue to communicate with them going forward. <clears throat> so, you know, marketing is also important because it's your way to stand out from the crowd. I think when you think about 
uh, farmers markets in particular, there's just so much competition there at any individual market at any time. You've got a lot of vendors um, selling a pretty similar set of products a lot of times if you're kind of a, a fresh produce vendor. Um, so it can be difficult to distinguish yourself in that kind of a setting. So using your marketing in ways that can distinguish yourself, your business from others is really valuable because what you see, um, I think what we found from customers who come to farmer's markets is it's, that it's really different than going to a grocery store. In a grocery store, you walk around by yourself, you find the things that you want, you take it to the checkout, you walk out. You're probably not having any direct interaction with any of the people working at the grocery store most of the time. But customers who come to the farmer's market, they wanna connect with you. They wanna build that relations too. They're not just looking to get their stuff and go. Usually, you know, in normal non-pandemic times, they like to hang out, like to bring the family, listen to music, buy some food hang out and eat if they can, and then kind of make it a, an event out of it for themselves. So, and part of that is really talking to the vendors and getting to know them and getting to know their products or catching up with a vendor that you go see week after week that you know pretty well. Um, it also gives an opportunity for them to trust your products. So your marketing, your brand, that really conveys uh, a very clear message about who you are and what sort of practices you use, how you produce your food items, and <clears throat> gives an opportunity for customers over time to once they build that relationship to start to trust you, trust your products and become very comfortable with purchasing. Then there's less of that decision making when they come to the farmer's market because they already know, oh, there's that vendor that I trust. So I'm gonna continue to buy those things because I've had good experiences with them. So looking up marketing, you know, if you've ever tried to kind of uh, take a look at what marketing means on Google search or whatever, there's just, there's a million different definitions and it can be very kind of confusing and overwhelming to pin down, you know, what the heck are we talking about when we talk about marketing to begin with? So here's just kind of a, a quick overview. It's kind of a way to break it down to hopefully give you a, just a nice little package of what marketing includes. So the first thing obviously is uh, you can't market if you don't have a product to market. So you got to figure out what it is that you can provide that again, fills that customer need. If you're just, if you've identified, you know, customers are coming up to me at the market and they're looking for this thing. I know that there's a need out there. However you go about determining that information, lots of pretty simple ways that you can do that kind of research on what customers are looking for. That's how you kind of make the determination. Like these, this is a product that I, I can grow, I can produce this. I know customers want it. So that's what I'm gonna go with. So that's kind of the first most critical part. Then you gotta figure out where am I gonna sell this product that I've now identified that consumers need. So you, most of you or all of you are either vendors or market managers at farmer's markets. So that's one of the best ways to really connect with consumers is to get right in front of them. Uh, to deliver the products right to their hands, uh, that direct-to-consumer marketing. But you might be down the road thinking about, well, you know, I'd like to try something different. I'd like to see if I can get in some grocery stores. How do I do that? And where are those markets located? How do I get my products onto those store shelves? So figuring out the product first, and then the place that you're going to market them. And then you got to figure out price. <clears throat> so... Ideally, your price that you're setting would be based on what it actually costs you to produce that item. So if you're um, not really tracking your production costs, if you're not kind of keeping track of, you know, how much it costs you to for seeds and soil and all these kind of things that go into the actual cost in your labor, um, it's going to be difficult to find a price that kind of really uh, benefits you and, and covers your cost of production. So we really recommend that people keep track of your production costs and, and use that as the basis for how you um, price your products. And we've got some resources that we'll share out uh, here soon after the trainings are completed that have some kind of basic kind of templates for how to track costs for production. But you can also, you know, you gotta also know what the market will support. So. One way to do that is to pay attention to what other people are charging for similar products. So maybe you go to a neighboring farmer's market in the next town over and kind of check out, you know, what are they selling their tomatoes for? 
what are they able to price for? And kind of use that also to kind of check your own pricing to make sure you're in the ballpark. You don't have to price it, everything exactly the same, of course. So you want to kind of distinguish yourself again. So maybe you can be selling things a little cheaper or you can get away with selling things a little higher than you had planned to. And that's, that's not a bad thing. So, and then always talk to your customers or just pay attention to how they react to your prices. You know, if something, you bring a new thing out on the shelves and, or a new thing out on your, your booth at the farmer's market and it's not moving at all, you know, that's a good indication that your price may be, may be off. So you can always ask your customers, you, if you have an email list of customers that shop with you regularly, um, you can email them a quick survey anonymously so they can fill it out that way. Or if you got somebody you trust, just ask them, you know, what do you think about this price? Would you buy it at this much? Or what about that? So lots of ways to kind of pretty quickly and easily get some feedback from customers. And then finally promotion. So promotion is kind of what we normally think about when we think about marketing. So promotion is all the methods that are used to tell current and potential customers the story of your market or your farm. It includes everything from a website, your social media, your Facebook um, pages, any sort of advertisements you might do on the local radio or newspaper, and then just the signage at your, at your farmer's market. So signage, and we'll talk about this a little bit later too, but signage is a really valuable and relatively cheap and easy way to promote your market. You can either, you know, including things, signage at the market itself, or if you're putting up signs around town leading up to the market so people see those, wherever you do it, you know, that's really valuable. So promotion is kind of last arm of, of what makes up marketing. <clears throat> so... Um, doing that consistently as much as you can make your promotions consistent in terms of how they look and how they feel and how people respond to them is really how you is about your brand. So what is your brand and how do you develop a brand identity is a really important part of marketing. And so before we kind of dive into the different components of a brand and what it all entails, I'm going to throw up a couple pictures here and just kind of get some feedback. So here's a picture from a farmer's market and just in the chat, or if you feel like unmute and if you wouldn't mind, just kind of uh, tell us what you see when you, when you look at this image, like what pops out at you? What are you kind of, what kind of reactions do you have to this, uh, this booth at a farmer's market? Ben, I've seen this many times now, but one yeah. thing that I've never mentioned is that I love the scallops on that top banner yeah. that it makes it have this homey feel to it that um, is very unique and appealing to me yeah that grid i've never noticed that before either that does really now that you say it i can't not see it it yes. does really stand out and in, in the, the chat ch candy says it is very eye-catching very eye-catching i agree with that absolutely anything else stand out to folks Along with it being homey, it is family related, Lori adds in the chat. Family, re yeah, absolutely, good. Yeah, so it's the Davis Family Sugar Shack, so it's family related, absolutely. It's got their name right in it, I like that a lot. A couple more things in the chat. Um, okay. Candy adds that a criticism could be that everything's on the table and there's no lift to the eye, which is a great point. It's very organized, but it doesn't have that vertical appeal. And Erin adds that she likes how they put their website in on the sign as well. Yes. Yep. Yeah, great. I like that too. And it's very simple. It doesn't, you know, it's just sugarshack.com. You can see right there, you know exactly how to find them. Uh, it's really simple and it just kind of blends right in with the, yeah, great stuff. I appreciate that feedback. Um, I would just add, you know, I really, I think part of what pops for me about this display is just the consistency of the coloring between the banner on the table and the banner up top. Got very similar kind of text font. Um, and the image is just, it's just so evocative. When I look at that image on the table banner, you know, you're in the cold woods in Wisconsin and you're just, I'm hungry for pancakes with maple syrup right now. I just, every time I look at this, I just think this is so, it so clearly communicates what the product is, 
and who they are. They are a family. It's a Davis family. They've got this product coming out of the trees in Wisconsin, um, and it just looks great. And I think it's really, really well done. I agree with Candy's point too. That's a really great point. A lot of times, and we'll talk about this a little later, you want to take advantage of that vertical space because people's eyes kind of are drawn to the different levels of things. So that is one thing that I think they could definitely improve for sure. All right, same thing. Let's take a look at this one. This is Grow with the Flow Aquaponics. They, um, this is from the downtown market in Lincoln in the hay market. What do, what do you see in this one or what stands out to you? I don't know if I noticed this before, but it looks like they have an album of maybe kind of like a portfolio on the table yeah. there, it looks like. So they can, it can really show you how you might use those flowers you know, in a different setting. Yeah, good point. I know that they do weddings and such like that. That's a great, I hadn't noticed that either. Erin adds, she likes how they put the website in on their sign as well, and the use of the different heights and colors. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's nice too, because they, uh, not only do they have the website, but they've got their Facebook and Instagram, you know, it's just at GWTF Aquaponics. So you can find them now on Facebook and Instagram uh, with a quick search of that tag. Yeah, and the colors are great. Having that van there just really takes it to the next level, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And I just, <clears throat> for me, this one is, again, yeah, the colors, for sure. The consistency of the colors. You've got the van wrap. You've got the, uh, the, the banner there on the pop-up tent is exactly the same. Uh, there's a, just a lot of consistency there. I saw one more chat pop up. Yes, Lori adds that the background shows their van and it doesn't distract. And I think that's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. And then the other thing that I really like about this one, you know, you've got the really professional van wrap here. You've got the pop-up tent that's really professionally done. It looks really nice. It's really consistency. But then they've got these tablecloths that are just matching the color, which I like. It's really simple, um, you know, and then the handwritten signs. I love these chalkboard signs. I think it just kind of shows that, yes, if you can pay a professional designer to create all these nice things for you, that's excellent and that's really great if that's something you can do. But you can make a display look nice with just some chalkboard signs, a couple tablecloths, and then just the layering. Yes, the, vi the visual layering of the flowers just looks so nice. So I think they just did a great job with the consistency and the overall display. All right, we're gonna do one more. So the last one, and this is a, a cheese vendor. So take a look at that and let us know what you see here. I think that his shirt has the same logo as the sign right behind him. That's nice. Yeah, absolutely. There's some consistency there and the market, the branding here is shirt, his sign back there is all the same. They've got the samples though. <clears throat> and the pictures of the different cheeses that they make. So you can tell right away that they're not just selling the two cheeses or they're not just making the two cheeses that are out there. They make all of these different products. Obviously uh, samples are always great if you can do it. Um, and I just, yeah, I like that. And I just the pictures here of this guy with his kids, it looks like, and the cows. So um, really nice way to kind of Again, connect with the consumer, tell your story a little bit. This is a person who's got kids, he's a family farmer, he's got these cattle, he's making this cheese, he's got all the pictures of the cheese on the left. And then just his demeanor, he, this looks like a guy that I wanna go talk to. I wanna go say hi to this guy, I wanna know what he's doing. He just looks friendly, he looks welcoming. He just seems like that. that's a part of how you market is how you present yourself, right? So you're telling your own story, the story of your farm, and how you present yourself. He's got the shirt on with the logo of the business and he looks friendly. He looks like he's, you know, he's not distracted with whatever, a cell phone or not paying attention or moving things around. He's sitting there, he's waiting for you to come talk to him so he can tell you his story. I like that a lot. I think somebody pointed out in one of our previous chains that this tablecloth is a little busy, a little distracting. So that might be something to consider in terms of just kind of how welcoming your whole overall display is. But I also like it just, it, the, whole, the whole setup here is really simple that doesn't, you know, as opposed to the last one where you had this professional graphic design on everything. Uh, this is a very simple, he's printed out some photos, put them on a cork board and displayed some other photos and, and that's it. It's pretty simple, but it, it's pretty effective, I think. 
All right, so moving on, that's just kind of, you can kind of see through those examples how uh, branding and kind of overall display really affects how you respond to the different products that are being sold. So I'm going to talk a little bit about different elements of your brand and things you can think about if you haven't like, you know, this, this applies to an individual business, but it also applies to the market itself. So if you're, you know, thinking about starting a new market or if your own market hasn't um, developed its sort of brand identity, here's some things to think about that you might want to consider. So your brand is the reflection of your personality. It's the personality of the market. So it's really important to think about how do you want your market to be received? What sort of personality does it have? Is it fun and light and kind of silly or are you kind of a little more focused on um, being a little bit more serious and direct and thinking about supporting family farmers and that kind of thing? Um, but it's important to like what sort of personality, how do, you want to, how do you want your market to come across? What do you want it to sound like um, when you're doing advertisements? Same kind of thing with your voice. So what sort of word choices do you want to use? Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit uh, here in just a minute about taglines and things like that, but thinking again, your personality and the voice, how do these go together? So you decided you have this kind of personality for your market. You know, for example, some markets are um, producer only kind of markets. So you're really kind of emphasizing direct producer uh, engagements and connection with consumers. That might have an impact on what sort of voice, what sort of words and language do you use as you, as you promote the market in different uh, media. Colors, we talked quite a bit about colors in these three examples. You know, you had the consistency of the colors. There's different colors that pop for people, um, colors, really inspired different feelings and set moods for the customer. Um, so really important to think about. It's not something just to kind of quickly pass over. You wanna pick out a couple main colors and then use kind of different tones within each one. You can kind of get quite a bit of diversity in color and look through that way. Um, take a little time, do some research on colors and kind of what uh, feelings people associate with those different colors. And then again, just matching that up to the personality to the different approach that you're taking to present in your market. And typeface, which we talked about a little bit as well. Um, noticed on a couple of those examples, like that first one, the maple syrup in particular, had a really consistent typeface. It kind of spoke to this sort of family product coming out of the woods and the trees. And <clears throat> I thought it was just a nice match for what they were doing. And same with the grow with the flow. Had a really nice, consistent sort of tone and typeface there but you wanna make sure you're picking something that's easy to read and that match your personality. And you only need a couple. So just find the couple typeface uh, choices that work for you and then stick with those. Be consistent with them in everything you do in your advertising. And then a tagline. So a tagline is really a, just a, it's kind of like a quick short description of the market that you will use in marketing. And it really becomes pretty versatile for you. So. It should be on your, you know, if you have a Facebook page and it kind of in the about this market, it should be in there. If you're um, doing an interview with a local newspaper or a local TV station, you know, a tagline is something you can, when they ask you, you know, so tell us about your market. Our market is whatever your tagline is to be. So it's a quick, short, one to two sentence description of the market and really what is the kind of key core values of the market and what you're trying to accomplish. And so one way to kind of, again, this is an opportunity for if you're a market manager, find some of those customers that come week after week that keep coming to your market and obviously are really invested in it. Really pick their brain. You know, what sort of words do they think about when they think about your market? What comes to their mind? And kind of use that as your, uh, the clay that you mold to make this tagline into something that you can really be excited about. Then consistency, we've talked about this quite a bit. You always wanna stay on brand. When, once you get all this kind of set, this is your, this is your toolkit now. So your colors, you, you know if you're doing a flyer, you, you know which colors you need to use. You know what the typeface should be. You know kind of what your voice and your tagline are. Um, just always be consistent because the more consistent you are, the more people start to recognize you and you start to distinguish yourself and then people will be drawn to that. Okay. And then kind of lastly for this section, just want to mention, you know, um, this kind of supplies to vendors maybe more than market managers, but it's applicable, applicable to both 
um, you know, it's really important at the end of the day that you're doing something that you're passionate about. So if you are a, a vendor at a farmer's market um, and you find that that's just not working for you, you don't enjoy the labor of going standing out in a market, it's a, it's a big decision. If, do you want to spend a good chunk of your week, like getting ready for the market, driving to the market, bringing all your stuff, standing out there for four or five, whatever, however many hours, and having that engagement with consumers one-on-one -on -one constantly. Some people are really excited about that. They get really energized about that. Other people would rather, you know, I'm into this because I like to be out in the fields. I like to be growing this stuff. That's, I like to get my hands dirty. And if there's, maybe I can wholesale everything to somebody and just be done with it, that part of it. So just, that's just an illustration to say, it's important to think about what you're really passionate about because the more you're excited about what you're doing, the more that customers are going to be excited about it too. And so really important to be at the market and have it be very obvious that you are excited to be at the market and you want to be there um, and not wishing that you were somewhere else. So that's kind of the end of that section. So I'm going to... Um, switch gears here and we're going to dive in. I'm going to go right in. If anybody has questions, feel free to throw them in the chat here or um, unmute quick. Um, and then I'll kind of get ready to go here for this next session. So this next part is going to be <clears throat> a little bit more on kind of practical um, marketing strategies and Facebook and social media kind of stuff. So but that is Skylar. Skylar and her partner, Matt, are, um, Skylar wears many hats and has worn many hats over the years. She's now the coordinator of Buy Fresh by Local, but she has been a market vendor. Her and her partner are, are farmers in Lincoln and they sell at some local markets. Um, she's also been a market manager um, at, uh, in Lincoln as well. Yeah, good question. So Candy is saying, I can see as a, individual vendors have a brand, but I wonder how you do that as a market. That's a great question, Candy. Um, so I'm gonna offer some suggestions. I don't know if, uh, anybody, if anybody else wants to offer suggestions here. And I'm thinking about, you know, Jen, the Sunday market, I think has a pretty defined brand. So if you are willing to unmute and tell us what you think about that, I'd be interested. But um, yeah, I think, I think the basics of it are basically the same. In my opinion, you know, I think, um, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit in this section of it, but really what you want to see is both the, the market and the vendors at that market sort of promoting everything together. The more that the vendors promote the market, the better, the more that the market promotes the individual vendors, the better it can be. So I, I think a lot of the things are pretty much the same. So a market can and should have a, a brand. They can have a logo, they can have a defined set of colors that they use and typeface. All those elements of the brand are just as important for the market itself because ideally that market manager is out in the community promoting the market itself. And you know the vendors might change from year to year, but the, the market is the place where the vendors come and the customers come. So having that kind of definition. And then some of that comes about through, you know, how, what sort of rules and regulations the market sets up for the vendors to come. So if you're, for example, and I mentioned this earlier, but you might be a strictly producer market. So you, you are only allowing people to come vend there that are the producers of those products. Or you could allow for, you know, some resale, some folks who are, sort of aggregating things that they didn't produce, but are just bringing them to market. So there's kind of different ways to set up the market structure that would have an influence on how you brand and market um, that as well. Um, yeah. I, I would add one thing with the market kind of choosing that voice or that theme. One thing that's going to be different is that it will, will be more of a shared, you know, decision. And so I think, you have to figure out, you know, who are the decision makers there? Like, who gets to say, you know, what the voice is? And rarely would it ever be one person, you know, when you're dealing with the market, but it could just be one person, you know, as an individual farm. And so you might want to pull, you know, the shoppers 
you know, to see like, why do you come here? What's, what do you get out of it? What are the feelings you have at the market? And then also pull vendors. And then if you have a board or have a few people who are helping you make that decision, um, just include all of that feedback, I think um, will help. And Candy adds, Jen has an amazing email and setup that she sends out to her vendors and market customers. Is there a market manager program to help our manager accomplish this type of great management? Um, ben, I'll, I'll let you um, take it. Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> so, and this kind of fits into what we're gonna talk about right here. So Buy Fresh by Local is a resource for that kind of stuff as well. So. Um, if Skylar were to hear, she could speak more articulately about Buy Fresh by Local, but basically it's a membership-based um, collaborative marketing program. So if you become a member of Buy Fresh by Local as of market, then they have some different resources and trainings that they can provide to you that would help with some of that stuff. So they've, you know, they have this, for example, you can see down on this screen, the bottom left there, that local food guide, you would be promoted in there. So you would have your image and, you know, your information about your market. So customers across the state could see that and come to your market. And, you know, they can certainly help with some signage and things like that, that can be displayed at your market um, and have great advice on how to kind of do what you're talking about, Candy, to uh, to, to sort of manage the kind of emails and communications that go out to different customers and things like that. And we are, so Aaron and myself and Skylar and Margaret on this team, we are happy to help you with that kind of stuff too. If there's, um, if you want to reach out to us and, you know, we'd happily set up a time to meet and talk to with your market manager and just kind of uh, help guide them in that kind of stuff. Can I chime in for a second? This is Jen. Please. Um, yeah. So I, I, of course, was not on board with um, the market when we went through the rebranding, when we moved from Old Cheney Road to our local, our current location um, in College View. So I, I'm not, I can't really talk to you about that process. Um, but, but coming on, this is my second year and I have found the Farmers Market Coalition as a great resource. And then, um, and that's something you can become a member of, but they also do have a lot of free materials um, and they do link to other um, entities that do training. Like I think Virginia um, does a lot of different training and sometimes it's free and sometimes it's paid for. There are some local or I guess some other national uh, and state programs which you, you can participate even if you're outside of the state from what I understand where there is a place where you can actually get a, a farmer's market manager um, training program and a certificate through that, um, which I haven't, I haven't done myself. I'm not at, as familiar with that, but I, I have seen people talk about that and, and the value of that. And then also there's a, a podcast that I love and they actually put on, it's called Intense. So like you're in a tent right at the market. Mm. Um, and so it's, um, it's, they have a podcast and then they actually do a conference, which is usually, I think, at the beginning of the year in San Diego. And they have a lot of resources. They have a Facebook page for uh, market managers where a lot, it's a lot of, um, can, uh, I guess, peer support, right? So you can ask a question and, um, and people will chime in with what they, um, what their experience was. And the, the woman who run, runs it, Cat uh, White, I think it's Kat Stevens White, I think is her full name potentially. Um, but she had, just has so much experience uh, managing markets. And she, um, like even with like strange legal things and COVID things, like it's such an, it's such an information resource. Um, and so that goes from everything from marketing to just day-to-day -day stuff. So um, I, I guess I would just say, don't, don't be afraid to reach out to some of those resources and you'd be surprised most of mine just found through Googling, right? Um, but there's a lot of lot of information out there and a lot of support because it's a it's a weird position to run a market, um, and and so um, we, there isn't necessarily as many resources in state, but there there's an opportunity where um, I guess we see, there's a, a support network um, where I've never been I've never asked a question that hasn't been given a hopeful answer from someone who's had a similar experience. So. Um, there's a lot of great support out there available if you just ask. So. That's great. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'll just add that Buy Fresh by Local in Nebraska is a member of the Farmers Market Coalition. 
So if you become a member of Bifresh by Local, they have access to all those resources, the paid resources that they can help you get access to as well. Thanks, Jim. So Aaron put in the chat to a link to a farmer's market toolkit out of Iowa. And so our project is based on re refiguring that um, toolkit for Nebraska. So hopefully I won't, I won't give a specific timeline on that, but we're working on um, uh, redoing that so it'll fit for Nebraska's market. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have that to share with you all. So, um, so here, just both markets themselves and vendors can join the Buy Fresh by Local Network. Um, it's a great resource. Um, their website has a lot of great information on it. They help promote your market. They help promote your business. Um, they provide training and resources and various things. So definitely recommend that you look into that and, and see if that's a good fit for your situation. So now we're going to kind of talk about, you know, displays at the farmer's market and kind of different things that you can do to increase sales and attendance at your market. And some of these are takeaways from the farmer's market living lab. And we'll share out a link to that after the training. So you have access to that too. That was a really great resource. It's based on uh, an experiment done in Delaware, kind of looking at different strategies and kind of measuring how it impacted uh, sales and attendance. So for vendors, um, kind of like we were talking about earlier, people buy more of what they can see. So this is kind of where the levels, putting things up high and making sure that uh, your things are really easily visible to, to customers has an actual impact on what they will buy. There, if you, you know, there's different ways that you can kind of follow what customers are looking at and things like that. And you can see that they're paying more attention when things are displayed in a certain way. Um, the old adage of stack them high and let them fly. So if you bring more, you sell more, you know, if you're, if you're bringing not enough stuff and it's selling out, then, you know, it's an indication that you need to start bringing more and then people to buy more of what they know they can use. So, you know, I think there can be a tendency to try to bring really unusual things to farmers markets. And some people are really into that. There's definitely a place for that. And I think you see that in some CSA models as well. But, you know, if people are coming to the farmer's market, they don't want to buy things and then have it just sit in the fridge and go bad and throw it away. They want to know that it's something they can use. They want to be familiar with it for the most part. Doesn't, it's not true for everybody, but for the most part, they want to know how to use this thing and what they can do with it. And then again, people want to know their farmer. So they want to connect with you. They want to build that relationship, just like it's important for you to build a relationship with the customer that's what they're there looking for as well. And they're going to buy from somebody that they know, that they trust, and that they like. So for market managers, um, some of the takeaways that came from this experiment, from this study done out of Delaware, <clears throat> is that some strategies to increase attendance at markets are host special events. Um, so, you know, there's lots of different ways to do that. I would love to hear in the chat from some of you, if you've tried different things that have worked really well, if you've tried special events that, um, have been impactful. So according to this research, special events resulted in somewhere between an eight and 30% increase in vendor sales, which is really huge. Obviously, you know, if you're getting up to 25, 30% increase in sales, that's a big deal. Um, so, and then also just clearly highlight it with signage and marker products that are used. So you can see with some examples over here in the pictures of some special events. Um, um, one of them, the bottom right's from Hastings. Actually, both of those flyers are from Hastings and they've done a really nice job of creating events. And you can see here too in the bottom right one, just an indication of the partnerships that they, they leveraged to make those things happen, which is again, just a great opportunity, connecting with partners in your community. It looks like they have an arts organization, the Downtown Hastings organization, YWCA, and some Healthy Hastings, which I think is a nonprofit promoting health and well-being. So good opportunity to cross promote there. Um, so one other thing that they highlighted was a secret word raffle to tell, test what advertising is most productive. So they use different media outlets to promote an event uh, over email. They did one thing and they, for each of those different strategies, they used a secret word. So when customers came, they could bring the thing that the flyer or whatever that it was and 
turn that in for a token, say some money to use at the market, some sort of prize. And then they would say what the secret word was. So then the people at the market knew what advertising brought them in. So it's just a way to figure out, you know, what's effective advertising in this community. It's a pretty clever approach there. Again, partner with organizations, like I mentioned, this Hastings example did a really nice job of partnering. So if you, this is a great way to, you know, leverage these partners, these organizations to promote your market. There's probably organizations in every community that have an interest in the farmer's market being successful, whether that's like a downtown business association that wants to see uh, entrepreneurs out there being successful because those are hopefully folks who down the road will get successful enough that they want a brick and mortar store in downtown or it's a, a health and well-being nonprofit or, or a hospital organization or whomever it might be, really lean on those organizations that you partner with for marketing and promotion. And then day of market signs. So that can be both at the actual market itself as people are coming in or just the displays that are around the market or you know, in the neighborhoods surrounding the market, maybe on a busy intersection nearby, you've got the signage up that's pointing people in the right direction, has the hours in the name of the market. Marketing, market signs are really valuable and people see them. Uh, people who would never see your Facebook post or your email message can be just driving around and catch that advertising right there. Vendors and market managers ideally are working together to promote the same market. Everybody benefits when there's more people uh, promoting the market. So this can happen in many different ways, but uh, you know, one very simple way is just kind of sharing social media posts. So if the market's putting out a, a Facebook post about next week's market and kind of highlighting some things that are happening, um, what really benefits that is if multiple vendors are sharing that on their page and telling their customers, telling their followers, hey, check this out, I'm part of this market and this is a really great thing. And vice versa, you know, if a vendor is highlighting, I've got sweet corn for the first time this coming week, come see me at the market, et cetera. And then if the market shares that on their page, it just, the more kind of views and shares and, and engagement that there is on social media posts, the farther it's gonna reach and the more people that are gonna see it. Special events, kind of like we mentioned before, uh, can really run the gamut from cooking demos to music, art, children's activities, uh, something that highlights a specific product um, that's coming in season. Um, vendors and, and managers should really work together on that because the vendors or the market managers need to know, hey, what's coming up that's really new and exciting that people are going to get behind from the vendors and then they can help promote that. So there should be a back and forth there. You can do market scavenger hunts giveaway baskets like in this bottom picture. And the big giveaway back basket is nice because you can involve multiple vendors and say, hey, what do you have that you could donate that we could try to draw some people in? And then you have some social media posts that kind of get people to engage, maybe respond to something and you draw a vendor that then comes to the marketing and gets this free thing, so. However, just a word of caution, social media is really important, it's really great, and we definitely recommend that you use it. But just keep in mind that only about 10% of your Facebook followers will be shown your post. It has to do with complicated algorithms that I personally don't understand very well, but they change a lot and Facebook kind of has this control over who sees your stuff when and how many people see them. So really if you want to, kind of what they're after is they're trying to get people, more businesses to boost their posts. So you can uh, do a promoted post on Facebook and other social media platforms. You can pay some money um, and it becomes kind of paid advertising that then they will send it out more broadly to more viewers and you'll get more views on your posts. So not always ideal and not every market um, has the budget for a lot of paid advertising. So you gotta be really careful about what you do. But I will say that Facebook paid advertising can be really cheap. You know, you can spend 10, 15, 20 bucks on a post and it's gonna go a lot farther than you would uh, normally. So not always a terrible idea. There's a reason to use it. Um, you know, it works best if you post regularly. 
Um, you know, you really want to keep your information up to date. So your contact info, your description, your hours, all that kind of stuff needs to be uh, up to date. Cause if somebody gets on your page and is interested in you and then they can't find out accurate information, you've probably lost that customer pretty quickly. And, uh, yeah, regular posts, there's lots of different uh, information out there, but typically people will say, you know, anywhere from three to four posts a week is pretty good. That's kind of where you want to land. Um, and we'll talk about how to kind of manage some of that here in just a minute. So a couple tips about what to uh, do to help your Facebook posts perform the best that you can. You want to use photos as much as you can, and they should be quality photos. Um, doesn't mean you can't use your phone for those iPhone cameras are typically okay. Just make sure it's not a blurry shot or uh, it's unclear of what's in the photo. You want to, if you can get some video to post that also works very well that Facebook tends to like that kind of um, media on there. Um, you know, again, this could be anything from the start of the market. You could walk around your phone and capture a quick video, just kind of walking through the booths and telling people what's happening um, to, you know, whatever that might look like. Um, again, cross sharing content from other vendors of the market. Um, make sure that it's clear where you are, that people can find you. And you can tag other people or businesses in your posts. So if you just use the at sign and then type out their name, you'll see a kind of a little list of potential businesses that you're trying to, if you click on the right one, then they'll get a notification that you've tagged them in it and their people will see it as well. So just, it's a pretty simple way to kind of increase your reach without uh, having to pay money or anything like that. So Skylar has here once to four times a week, do a post of some sort, you could post boost posts like we talk about. And that's, yeah, she's good point here. You want to maybe save those for your first week to kind of really drive up some attendance in the first week, or if you have special events. And then it's not a bad idea to create an actual event in Facebook for uh, particular markets. If you have something special going on, if you create an event and share that out, then people can respond and say that they're coming and then get updates if you change the event or if anything happens. So it's just a nice way for people to stay in touch and stay connected. So here's one example of um, an engaging post. This is the Village Point Farmers Market in Omaha um, who did this recently. Here's a, just kind of an example of how you can get some engagement from your followers on Facebook. So they put up this photo of the okra there and just said, you know, in the text there, what am I? Do you know what this is? Tell your favorite way to prepare it and you could win $10 in farmer bucks at the market. So then she's blocked them out, but you can see that there are a lot of different responses here. Uh, people, we got 33 comments on this, which is great. Um, and it's just, again, it's a great way for keep people connected, keep them engaged. They're kind of hoping to get that $10 to come to the market and maybe more of these people will come too. So anything like that, that gets folks commenting and talking on your post is a great thing. So when you're thinking about the market and marketing your, your farmer's market, you really want to be thinking about what you can be doing before the market, at the market, and after the market also. So in your pre-market uh, kind of experience leading up to your, your weekly market, you want to, again, just make sure you have that online presence so that customers can get to know you before they shop at the market. Um, hopefully that's, you know, includes a website, your Facebook, whatever kind of social media that you're using. There's lots of different opportunities there. So if you're a Buy Fresh Buy Local member, you're listed there, that's another source of marketing. And there's sites like Local Harvest that um, list where farmers markets are across the country. You wanna be engaging with your current and future customers. So e-newsletters are great. If you've got an email list serve, again, if you're capturing email contact information uh, for folks who come to your market, then you can keep in touch with them directly throughout the week leading up to it. And kind of like we talked about in the beginning, if your products aren't solving a customer need or solving a problem for them, um, they're less likely to come. They're not likely to come. So if you can demonstrate to them how your products can help them solve a problem or you, ways that it fits into what they're looking for, that can be really valuable. So during the market, 
again, you, you want to connect with these people. You want to start building those relationships. You want to create repeat customers who will seek you out, find the products that you have at the market. So there's some really kind of simple, low cost ways to do that. Uh, you can see the picture here. This is the chili woman. She's from Indiana. Uh, smile, be friendly and wear a name tag even as a good example of how you can just kind of be welcoming and friendly to customers that come. You know, she's got the peppers on her apron there. She's got peppers all around her. She looks really friendly and happy to be there. And that's the kind of engagement that you want your vendors and your market managers to be putting out at all times. Um, so one suggestion too is if you have products that you can't display on your tables, let's say you have some frozen meat products or eggs or whatever it might be, have pictures of it outside of the coolers. Again, people buy what they can see. If they just see coolers and they have not sure what's in there, um, they're less likely to kind of make that sale. Um, so simple way to do it is just to kind of have pictures from your farm uh, of your products. Oops, sorry about that. Um, et cetera. So if you're a vendor, putting signs up about your farm to introduce yourself. So again, we saw, thinking back to that example earlier from the cheese vendor or had pictures of himself, um, and his kids with on the farm with the cattle really kind of does a lot of the work of kind of communicating who you are uh, to your customers. So another option for social media is to go live on Facebook or Instagram. Um, so again, this could be a good opportunity to do some video. So you get up to the start of the market and you get your phone out, you go on Facebook live and you can just kind of walk around and talk to people live on Facebook and kind of display what's happening and talk about what's going to be at the market that particular week. Social media kind of think of the thought of posting three to four times a week can be a little bit overwhelming. It can be daunting. So we definitely recommend a marketing calendar to follow. Um, it doesn't have to be very complex. There's lots of different examples out there and templates out there that you can use. This is actually the Buy Fresh, Buy Local marketing calendar for 2020 for Facebook. And you can see there, there's not, it's not that complicated. They just have the weeks listed, the dates that it covers, and then they're trying to do five different posts a week. So, and then they just have examples. So each, each one of these is a different Buy Fresh, Buy Local member that they're gonna promote on that particular day. And you can see they have the categories that they're trying to promote on the end. So really important, helpful to have a marketing calendar, to keep yourself organized. Doesn't have to be super complex. Whatever works for you, it can just be an Excel spreadsheet with the dates and what you want to highlight that particular week. And the great thing about Facebook too is you can, you can pre-write your posts and schedule them to post later in the week or whenever you need to. So you could, on Sunday, write your three posts for the week and schedule them to post on different days and be done with it and not have to think about it the rest of the week. So marketing calendar can really help you do that. So collecting metrics at your market is definitely something to think about, particularly if you're trying to figure out who's coming to your market, you know, what are they looking at? Uh, what, what can we do better to bring more people in? And this is something, a service that Buy Fresh, Buy Local can help you with as well. Um, so they can help you kind of conduct these surveys, ask the questions, and collect the information um, in, in collaboration with you. So for the market manager, this might be things like total attendance, sales, sales from each market stand, page follows on Facebook, or customer surveys. And this is a picture of Skylar over here doing some dot surveys at a farmer's market um, where she's kind of helping them out with collecting some information. As a vendor, you might want to um, be tracking your weekly sales, your number of transaction, page follows on Facebook, um, or if you have an email list subscribers, how that kind of grows over the weeks. And then just make sure that if there's anything unusual happening, if there's rain or snow or it's a holiday, that's going to have an impact on your numbers. So you want to make sure you account for that and just make a note of that. Put it out to the group here. Um, Anything that you want to try this year or you want to think about for next year, um, any of the examples that we shared here that kind of stood out to you as a strategy that you think you want to try at your market, go ahead and unmute and let us know or throw that in the chat. Uh, we'd love to hear that from you. And if there's any questions about that stuff, happy to answer that as well. And then while we're thinking about that, I'll just mention here, so Buy Fresh by Local manages a market manager Facebook group. It's a private group for active farmers market managers across Nebraska. 
that information is there at that link. Uh, we will certainly share that with you all so you have access to it. But great place to communicate with each other, share resources and ideas uh, with other market managers. And there's uh, Skyler's contact information. Um, and then this website down here is the website for this project that we're working on um, by localnebraska.org slash go to grow. And so you can find all the information about uh, this project and uh, where farmers markets are across the state. Okay, great. Well, yes, I'm Erin Schoenberg. I'm with the Center for Rural Affairs and a little bit of background um, on my own experience with, you know, the farmers market scene. Um, over the years, I have been a produce grower myself, um, ran, ran a CSA farm, worked for a couple different um, farmers and nonprofits at their market booths. I have run um, like a trucking company for local food and been part of a local food distribution company. So I have quite a bit of varied experience kind of in the local food world. So, um, you know, if that just helps um, you know, provide some context there. Um, follow up with me on any of that. And for the last half of tonight, we're going to cover vendor recruitment and vendor retention. And I always like to just keep in mind, oh, I'm having trouble moving slides here, that this isn't just for market managers. Even though, of course, when you're talking about recruitment, it seems like that's really who you're, who you're talking about. But there really are considerations that the vendors can keep in, keep in mind as well. And for sure, it's a big team effort. That is really bottom line, you know, with farmers markets. So what it really boils down to is it's all about marketing, really. It's what does the market have to offer the vendors and what does each vendor have to really bring to the market and be appealing. So it's always a two-way street there. And in the spring, as most of you know, we were able to have some conversations over the phone with managers statewide. And we heard a lot, you know, regarding recruitment. And we heard that, you know, as you can see here, that team effort is super important, emphasized. There's a lot of word of mouth recruitment, a lot of just bringing people in that way, as well as social media is used. A lot of these markets around the state are very rural and there's not too much of a budget and it does um, cost, you know, time or money or both um, to, to really get out there and, and push in certain ways. And so that's, you know, one challenge. And we've also heard that vendors are happier when they are included, um, at least to some degree in the decision making. So those are just, you know, some of the factors that play into this. Of course, we are talking about rural areas and we know there are some specific challenges to small towns and more remote areas. And so here are some of those challenges that managers and vendors deal with. There simply aren't as many vendors out there. You know, by default in a rural area, there aren't, there aren't as many people. And that is something that we can overcome because, um, it's just really catering to those who are there and making sure you're, you're meeting those needs. So again, there aren't as many customers there. A lot of rural residents garden, but we also need to keep in mind, it's not just produce that's sold at a farmer's market, even though that we do kind of, um, you know, have produce as such a mainstay in our, in our imagery of farmer's markets. And we know that managers are often spread, you know, pretty, pretty thin, you know, um, even just from the little conversation we had there during the break. It's a lot to, it's a lot to do. It's a lot to handle. And so, especially if there's not much um, funding to provide, you know, a stipend of some sort to the manager, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. However, we also know that there are opportunities in rural areas that are very important and we can really leverage those to, to have success. Um, I'm from a very small town. I'm from Bassett originally. And, and I know that rural communities are very tight knit. There's this pride in being from a small town and wanting to support the locally owned businesses that are there locally. You know, not just around the holiday season, but year round, you really know there's this 
support for local businesses. So that's something to, you know, hang on to. Quality, nostalgia, you know, handcrafted goods also have um, a, a large role in the values of small towns. And because in more remote areas, you're not inundated with events constantly, each social event does have more potential to really, um, to really rally the troops, to really get people there. You know, I am just outside of Lincoln right now, and even during a pandemic, there are dozens of events, you know, happening every week. But in a small town, when there are fewer events, each one can really stand out more. So thinking about the farmer's market in a small town, that can be one of the social events that stands out. So we know that farmers markets are team efforts and you know four of the team players you could say would be the community, the customers with their wallets, the manager or the managing body, and then diverse and reliable vendors. And those you know descriptive words are really important here you know and the, the community might be the municipality allowing you to open up Main Street, maybe to reroute you know, automobile traffic from a certain street and just having champions and advocates there who might not be directly related to the farmer's market, but who are your biggest cheerleaders. So that community support is huge. The buying, you know, emphasis there on customers, just it, it gets to the point that you want a crowd there and not every single person has to be spending big bucks, but you need enough people there, you know, really making solid purchases to make it worth it. Of course, the management um, is what holds everything together. And then you need vendors who will show up, you know, on a weekly basis and who are diverse enough to cover the needs of customers and not just be, you know, 20 vegetable growers. You want to make sure you have um, diverse products there. And you can see this is the market manager at Fallbrook, which is the, the closest market um, to me and you can see this manager is really engaged. She's got her buy fresh, buy local food guide. So she's a part of that supportive community. You can see the vendors there. If, if you were able to see a little more closely, they've got a, a widespread of products. You see shoppers there, even though it's you know in the middle of a pandemic. And so you can see that this team effort is really, um, is really coming to fruition there. So we will cover five steps in recruiting vendors, so we will um, start with targeting vendors. So to begin with, we don't know how to reach vendors until we know who we want to reach. Otherwise, we're really just you know, throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks. And so we need to have more of a focus on who are we really going after to come in and be a new vendor for us. And so how to answer that question is, is to ask ourselves, what are we trying to accomplish? Do we want a market that has such a diversity of products that a customer could come and buy all of their groceries for the week? Or do we maybe want to be known as truly a, a green farmer's market where there are very few crafts? Uh, maybe there's an emphasis on um, you know, practices that are less conventional, that are, that are, you know, less maybe chemical um, uh, part of that production? Or do we really want to be maybe more of a, more of a craft market and have a 50-50 split? And how to really answer that question is finding out what will your customers buy? What will they spend money on? That's really, you know, um, ultimately what you need in order for the market to be sustainable year to year. And so I just threw a couple pictures in here of, you know, fresh fruit, which is generally a, a popular item at a farmer's market. We know customers will buy that. Then we also have some beadwork here. And this specifically is from the Santee Sioux Nation Art Show and Community Market. And so beadwork is one of those things that you might not know whether it's a good idea or not to look for, you know, artists such as this if you don't know if customers will spend money on that. So finding that out is, <laughs> is a really important um, process. So this is me at that market. You know, how do you know what I'm gonna spend money on? Like the point is that you don't, you really don't until 
you somehow can get my feedback. So we don't want to exclude anything from the get go without making an effort to find out what people will buy and then cover this in part of his presentation. But this dot survey is an example of how you can hear from the customers. So even during COVID, you know, me in that last picture, if there was a, you know, a big um, kind of like sandwich sign, you know, set up, I could easily go over there and safely um, mark my choices. You know, what did I come here for? How often do I come? What do I spend money on? Maybe what's not here that that's missing. And so you can decide, you know, what questions do you want to do you want to gather um, from folks and dot surveys are just kind of a fun and easy way to do it. This is a way to involve kids at the market, you know, as well to go put the sticker up there to represent your choice. You also want to keep in mind neighboring markets. It's a great idea to become, you know, friends or acquaintances, at least with other area market managers, you know, and some of you might be, you know, on the same call this evening, but there might be vendors who you could share, you know, vendors who would really like to participate in multiple markets if only you had set the days and times up for that to be doable. You also want to think about groups who maybe don't regularly vend. And so they might be great producers at your market, but maybe they've never been approached. Maybe they don't feel welcome or even know it's an option. And so the two examples here might be a local FFA chapter and possibly, you know, an, an immigrant community member who is a great, um, you know, baker or grower or anything, but don't realize that there's a place for them at the market as well. So think about groups that have maybe been left out for one reason or another. You also want to think about your short term and your long term priorities. And so I think the example I generally use here is something like with a like a sweet, right? Like a sweet treat. You might find that there's a certain, um, I don't know, monster cookie that's really popular right now. But do you want to like let in five monster cookie vendors this year just because you know they'll all sell out in 2020? Well, maybe not because then you might feel like you need to let them in next year. Maybe the monster cookie craze will be over by then. You know, you really want to think about your long term strategy and, and not just kind of go after anybody who would set up a card table, right? You want to be a little more strategic about it. Then you're going to want to think about what is stopping these vendors, you know, from from making themselves known to the market and what's stopping you from being able to really, you know, find them and bring them on. In some cases, you know, like in the rural challenges we spoke of, there might be a lack of vendors. You just have to, you know, um, address that, maybe think about a wider area that you're reaching out to and setting up your market, you know, day and time in a way that a larger area could be covered. You want to think about, you know, um, the, the production, maybe capability of certain producers, if they're at more of a hobby level, but they have ambition to scale up, that might be something to consider finding ways to support them, you know, bringing in production classes, perhaps, you know, business development classes as well. There might be concern over the rules and regulations, which might mean that um, there's just been confusion around them in the past. Maybe a uh, past manager wasn't very clear about um, letting people know the rules or perhaps enforcing the rules, you know, fairly. Um, there might not be any rules, and that actually could be very problematic because then people don't know what to expect. Um, you know, timing has been mentioned, but you just want to make sure you are setting up the market in a, in a way that's convenient for shoppers, but also for vendors. And then just the perception and awareness, you really want to work on building that reputation, you know, over the years. And competition can exist, but we want to overcome that and, and focus more on collaborating, you know, with markets and between vendors as well. And that can be um, of something where you, you work on the balance of vendors at the market. So you don't have too many, you know, competing vendors for certain items. You want to try to try to spread diversity out. 
So the next step will be act. And essentially with this, we're thinking about, you know, who we are trying to bring into the market, what's stopping them from getting here, and then what can we do to overcome those barriers. And I've got my, my coworker, you know, Anna here, she's, I'm pretending that she has put together a little um, marketing the market handout. And that's one thing that you can really set aside some time to do. You can think about, well, what is my market doing really well? And this might be something that you need to ask vendors about, ask customers about, ask, you know, um, people who are in the community but not directly engaged with the market and think about what, what potential do we have to draw people in. And it doesn't have to be anything, you know, really showy or really numbers based, but it can be. It could be something about what a great location you have, you know, maybe you're under a cottonwood grove and it's just a really lovely setting with lots of shade and breeze. That can be something you highlight. You might highlight the fact that you're actively growing your market each year. You know, even if those numbers aren't huge, even if you're going from, you know, five vendors to seven vendors, you can still just use those facts in a way that really presents a case that your market's got good things going on. You always want to think about um, making changes to the rules, but you have to keep in mind that you can't make abrupt changes or that can really, you know, cause some chaos, um, in particular with your, your core vendors who you really want to, to make sure you're on, you know, the same, the same page with. Um, you always want to, yeah, collaborate with the other markets, try to engage in, you know, groups like this, in that Facebook group online where managers can can, you know, um, touch base with each other and get ideas. And then think about some of those trainings addressed in the last slide, the barriers where, you know, how can we get people to scale up their backyard garden into more of a, more of a, you know, profitable farm enterprise. And of course, just throughout all of this, um, good communication and patience is such, such um, an important piece of this. So then we were going to put that strategy to work. And this, um, and we'll, we'll go through an example of an outreach plan on the next slide, but I wanted to just put straight up at the beginning, you know, get out that calendar. I think that example from the first, you know, part of the evening about the marketing, that marketing calendar, once you have something written down, you have dates, you know, circled, you have a task to do on that date. You know, we're all busy people. But once you get to that day and you see the task that was set aside for you by yourself, you know, in the past, you will do that. That written plan, that calendar is, is just such, um, such a way to take action. And of course, fall and winter are really great months to, to get out there and talk to vendors because people do really need to make their plans, you know, for the year before the season gets too busy. That group effort is always so important. There's really no better case that can be made for the market um, that's not from a vendor. Like vendors can really sell the market so well because they're the ones who've had a good experience or not. They're the ones who can really speak to what the dynamic is like on a week to week basis. You know, what kind of communication that the, um, the manager has with folks, how vendors voices are heard you know, throughout the season and the post season. So making sure the vendors are part of that team is huge. And um, just have your materials ready. You know, take that upfront time to get together your, your little handout to, to make sure your application is up to date and keep paper copies handy, keep links, you know, handy to share online. So you're prepared when those vendors um, are ready to take the next step. So this, um, this is, an outreach plan that can be found with the uh, West Virginia Farmers Market Association Toolkit. And that's one of the links that we'll share with everyone after these trainings. It's just a really in-depth amount of information similar to what I'm presenting today, just, just more in-depth. But this can really get that plan on paper. And I won't go through every little piece of this, but I filled out a couple examples. Um, leaving some, leaving some squares blank, you know, to make you think 
right? Uh, we won't go through all of these because I, I do want to be aware of, of our time this evening. But let's just, you know, take a minute to think about this. You want to get your, your outreach strategy in mind, write it down, you know, think about what is the purpose of that specific strategy? Who are you really targeting? What follow-up needs to take place? And it's important to think about time, you know, to help you measure your, your steps with this. Put that on the calendar. The estimated costs involved, you want to think about time and you want to think about actual, you know, supplies, cost. Who's responsible? Who's going to help? What are some of the main tasks involved with this strategy? And then, you know, set some deadlines for yourself. And then I won't go through, you know, all of these, but basically these are some examples that you could use in the outreach plan, you know, on the previous slide. And a lot of these you might have already done. A lot of these aren't, you know, novel necessarily, but it's good to think about some of the strategies that you might use and then go back to your thoughts on, wait a second, who am I actually trying to target here? Because you can very quickly, you know, lose track of that focus and go back to just, I just need anyone, you know, we just need vendors to come. But you want to take a step back and remember that plan. You know, what will customers buy? What is our, what is our vision? What are our long-term goals? And then, you know, who are we trying to reach out to? So that will just help you stay focused and, and get those results. And then once you do have, you know, the vendors on board, and this will um, lead into the next um, part of the presentation too, but you just want everyone to feel at home. You want everyone to feel welcome. A little orientation packet is one way that um, you can do that. You know, include some information about you as a manager, um, you know, let people know that you're going to have, you know, a post season potluck, for example, and that, um, you know, that you will be responsive to needs, but you won't, you know, um, you know, you won't make reactionary decisions in the moment. Just kind of set that tone for how you want to um, have that back and forth relationship. The weekly maintenance of relationships is huge. You know, being there at market day, saying hello to vendors, just making sure that, you um, that the little details are handled. That really goes a long way for vendors to know that that um, you know they are a valuable part of the market team. And so hopefully vendors, you know, who are you know here tonight are kind of serving multiple ro roles. Hopefully this gives you some things to look for in markets as well. You know, thinking about how supportive is the community or what can be done to bring more support from the community? And really taking a step back and thinking, well, what, what do I have to offer the market? What could I be doing better? You know, how could I look for resources to scale up or to have a longer season of a certain product? You know, am I being a good communicator? Is the manager being a good communicator? It just gives you some, you know, some thoughts and some, some, um, some motivators to to really get that focus and thinking about as well if you'd like to see more vendors at the market even though you're not the manager perhaps there are things you can do you know and like we said that that word of mouth that vendor to vendor recruitment is really probably the the strongest you know um partner that you can have you know as a as a manager as well so we won't um, spend too much time on the retention piece, but we will go through a few more things to keep in mind for once you've got vendors, you know, how to keep them happy, how to really um, have that good, strong team. This is just a little recap slide I won't read. But again, with the recruitment piece, there are like five main steps that we can think about cultivate, govern together, manage money, promote, and nurture and grow. So with cultivate, you know, we really want to keep in mind that there's a triple bottom line, you know, with markets, which is serving customers, you know, serving, um, 
vendors and serving the community. And so I think the customer piece of it gets a lot of focus, right? With any, with any business, you're thinking about keeping the customer happy, but you don't want to forget about the vendors because they play just such an important part of that team. And so creating that culture that could be as simple as, you know, the social aspect, the daily and weekly maintenance of those relationships um, is a really, is a really important piece of it, making sure they feel like um, it's, it's a team they want to be a part of for a long time. The govern together stuff is huge. You know, we have heard from managers and from vendors that it's very important that vendors know their voices matter. And this is somewhat of a balance and a fine line. You know, during the season, managers, it's important that just because a vendor comes up and says they have a problem, the manager can't drop everything and just, you know, focus on that one thing. There are always many sides to consider many, um, many reasons why you want to have a more um, like in-depth approach to that. Um, you know, an off season is a really good time to make any larger changes, you know, as far as policies, rules, and that go. During the season, it can be very busy and you have to have just a structure in place, you know, those clear rules and you need to be able to fairly, you know, equitably enforce those rules. And there's a lot of respect that goes both way um, when that consistency exists and that communication is there. Um, so that govern together piece was really couldn't be more important. Of course, managing money and being very transparent with how any market funds are spent is also really important. That, that trust is huge. And I have to just always include the have money to manage in the first place in here because we know that a lot of very small town markets um, operate on very few, you know, very low vendor fees, and there might not be that much, you know, outside funding coming in. But the more, um, you know, if you're able to have even just a small amount of weekly fees, you're really able to go a pretty long way with that. And it also helps, um, you know, vendors know that they've got skin in the game and it can really help them value the services that the manager provides a little bit more. And I think even help the manager um, value their role um, more as well. But of course, um, vendors, you know, have every right to know what the fees and what the funds are being spent on and that will help them help the market as well. If they can say, oh, well, I know we're, you know, we're offering these classes next winter and it's going to be great. That's really cool that our market does that. I'm happy to contribute my, you know, $20 weekly stall fee for that. It's really neat that we have these opportunities in the winter. You know, it, it will help vendors um, be able to make the case um, for how great your market is too. So the managing the money um, step is always in there. Of course, the promote piece is huge and we talked a lot about that in the first hour, but for vendors to want to stick around, you know, for the long game, they, it's, it's always nice when there are more opportunities that exist that can bring in those customers, you know, keep them interested and in purchasing on a weekly basis, and then also be directed toward, you know, vendor education as well. Um, always keep in mind that you don't have to do it all. You can't do it all. You can't do it all all the time. You know, we're only humans. And a lot of us are probably stretched pretty thin, you know, in some of the participation, especially during, you know, the busy season. But like Jen said as well, in the, in the prep, you know, prior to the season really kicking off, there's a lot to be done. And don't, you know, beat yourself up about not being able to do it all. But try to take the winter anytime you have a little bit of a slower season to get that plan together, get your team together. And and write it down and put it on the calendar and and um, it'll be it'll be more doable that way. Um, here are just some other thoughts on promoting um, you know all of the great work that the market is able to do and all the people that you can reach. You want to be thinking about communities that might not have again known that they were welcome as vendors but also as customers. 
Um, this is just a fun picture. This is from the Holiday Bazaar in Macy, Nebraska. The center had held some vendor trainings and then um, some of their staff actually went and attended the market and were customers there as well. So just that partnership can be so huge that can really go both ways and the community can know that um, you know, this, this market is, is part of that community and it can really yeah, go both ways. And I wanted to, of course, add a little info about, you know, the pandemic and how managers as well as vendors can really pivot. And that can be um, an impressive piece that will keep customers engaged, but also keep vendors um, really aware that, that the market is trying to do everything they can to, to, to push local food um, regardless of what else is going on. And so in this sign, you can see some of the sponsorships, you know, listed there at the bottom. Looks like this one is from Credit Services, Cattle Bank and Trust. And so it appears from this sign that they were able to probably help cover, you know, the cost of some of, some of the signage. And so even if you are in a situation where you don't have, um, you know, too much funding to work with, but you really want to, you know, um, make things happen, make marketing and promotion um, um, things happen, partnerships can be one, and sponsorships can be one really great way to do that. And in this particular case, you know, I'm sure that the manager had some amount of support, but she was able to establish a curbside pickup, you know, service for the farmer's market. Um, I participated the day that um, I got this picture. I just filled out this really easy form online. I was able to pick up my order there and run my card um, at the market manager booth. And she actually came over yeah, to the car. So not that in every case you will go to all of these lengths, but it's important to try to stay on your toes and, you know, adapt to um, just to stay, to stay relevant and to keep to keep everyone engaged. And, you know, nurture and grow kind of just um, continues on that same path of making sure that the communication is always there, that you're taking in feedback and just continuing to improve the market. Think about ways to, um, you know, take advantage of resources that are out here for you, um, you know, such as the, the organizers of this session tonight, you know, buy fresh, buy local, extension, the center, you know, we're happy to try to help um, relay resources to you, be resources ourselves. Um, there are some of the groups that have been mentioned and the great resources, you know, in the chat and that we'll be sending out. But um, it's something that Skylar said in a previous um, session, that ambition and dedication really is needed um, on both the vendor end and the manager end to want to continue with the market to be nurtured and growing for years to come. And so we want to be, you know, part of that for you. So please, um, you know, just keep reaching out to us. Special thanks for tonight to that West Virginia Farmers Market Association because they do just have so many great resources that I was able um, to draw from. Well, thank you everyone for joining us.